thank our generous sponsors for tonight. Um, Human Rights Watch, Santa Barbara, the County of Santa Barbara Commission uh, for Women, Wealth Management Strategies, which is led by Guy Walker, as well as Visionality, which are our tech partners helping to make tonight a great event. Throughout tonight's program, uh, we'll throw out a few polling questions. Don't be shy to uh, respond. It's a really good way to get feedback and uh, hear what everybody's thinking, um, or see, I suppose I should say, see what everybody's thinking in real time. Without further ado, let me introduce James Joyce III. His story begins in Maryland and his journey had stops at Ohio University as a student athlete, another stop in Yakima, Washington as an award-winning journalist, and another stop in Santa Barbara where he served uh, as Senator Hannabeth Jackson's uh, district director. In Santa Barbara in 2016, James launched Coffee with a Black Guy. James is a civil rights activist and a social entrepreneur. You can read about his 2021 run for Santa Barbara mayor in the Red Canary Collective. You'll find that in the link uh, that was just dropped in the chat. James serves on several boards and has received recognition from the NA NAACP. James is a leader who's willing to use his experience to foster dialogue and advance our reckoning with race in America. James. Thank you so much, Casey. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody who's uh, joined this evening. This is a very important conversation. Um, I, I wanna kind of give a quick little primer as to how we got here, and why we're talking about reparations. I'll introduce Makai who will frame uh, some research. Makai served as, a, as an intern for Coffee with the Black Guy for almost two years now, uh, but is also uh, uh, very involved on UCSB's campus. And so he was working on a, a research project that really coincided with the work that Coffee with the Black Guy uh, was, was doing. Uh, but how we got to reparations, and some of you all may have read some of this in, in some of the, 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 the articles that have been published uh, in the past uh, two weeks on this issue locally, is that you know, folks continually ask this. We've been having Coffee with the Black Guy conversations. They're starting as conversations, right? A reason for folks to come to get together, to learn about others' uh, perspective uh, based on an issues, based on issues of race and perspective. And, uh, but then where do the conversations go? Okay, so you know better, do better. We've talked about that. But at the end of that, folks really wanna know what the action is. And at the end of that conversation, reparations has repeatedly come up as, as the, the, the next move, the things that we need to be ready for. Uh, and so throughout several of these uh, Coffee with the Black Guy conversations, the, the, the topic of reparations has come up. Uh, and then to the point where there's been um, some offerings where we've even asked that specific question about what, what, uh, how you feel about reparations. And the overall response, if I can recall, the overall response to that were uh, long overdue uh, or I, overwhelmingly, I'd like to know more. Right. And so that's why we're here tonight is because folks want to know more. And I think it's an important conversation to have because uh, um, it, uh, it, it's a conversation that's right at our doorstep. Um, so as we get started with the polling, uh, I want to go ahead and, and, and um, uh, uh, before we get, get kicked off, before Makai starts to give us a little primer, uh, we'll go ahead and start the poll and find out how much do you know about reparations on a scale of one to ten. Uh, you know, those of you who, who are, are, are with us this evening um, on the Zoom, those who are, are, are uh, tuning in via live stream, you can't participate in this. That's why it's important to register. Um, but uh, uh, on a scale of one to 10, how, do you, how uh, much do you say you know uh, uh, about reparations at this point? Feel free to participate uh, um, and uh, submit your response and that stuff will, will populate here. As that's happening, let me go ahead and give you, you heard a little bit about uh, Makai. Makai Mitchell has been um, uh, you know, interning with Coffee as a Black Guy for the past two years. I, uh, he originally uh, was um, sent to me uh, from, um, uh, as, as an intern, potentially for the office for Senator Jackson when I was working at the state Senate. 
Uh, and at the time it was COVID and we weren't uh, uh, engaging interns at the time. And so I didn't want young talent to go to waste. And so it was great to be able to connect with Makai and he's been interning uh, uh, with Coffee with the Black Guy uh, uh, for, like I said, the past two years. He's also uh, a diversity and equity uh, advocate for the uh, uh, UCSBs, that's University of California, Santa Barbara's uh, Office of Black Student Development. It's a new office that was created uh, by the chancellor um, uh, but he's a, a diversity and equity uh, um, advocate there, uh, and he's going to be sharing some information on his uh, senior research thesis for the Black uh, Studies Department. Um, uh, Makai, if you could uh, uh, take it away and share with us what a little bit, give us a little bit of a primer on uh, um, reparations. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you again, James, for that warm welcome. Uh, my name is Makai Mitchell, as you mentioned. Um, it's truly an honor and a privilege um, to be here today and I look forward to what will be an incredible discussion um, on the topic of reparations. Um, I put together a brief presentation uh, to just to provide a preview of kind of a much larger project that I'm doing um, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, this topic here, it, it's, it's relevant and it's necessary and, and, and it's been of great interest to me for a while and we're looking at the work of the Black Panther Party, to the, you know, the Republic of New Africa, to even the work that the California Task Force and Reparations, um, with, with help from our, you know, our, our guest today, Camilla Moore has been doing, um, it, it's just something that I, I really stuck out to me. And I, I sort of realized that it's the responsibility uh, of my generation to ensure that this conversation continues and, and continues to move forward and, to, and that we make sure that reparations are executed within our lifetime. And so um, with that being said, I present to you a conversation on an app on reparations and Afrofuturism. Next slide, please. All right, so just briefly providing an introduction and, and kind of going over my thesis for my research. Um, the thesis states that black bodies were critical to the development and survival of American capitalism, and yet the system itself has found a way to discredit blacks for their contributions and production while also excluding them from its profits. My research will attempt to explain how this ironic structure has come to be and continues to exist with intentions of making a case for the production of restorative justice in the way of reparations. Furthermore, by applying an Afrofuturistic lens to our discussion, we we'll allow ourselves the opportunity to use reparations as a means of liberation for Black people in America. So just briefly going over the thesis there. Uh, next slide, please. So over the course of this presentation, I would implore you all to just consider a few questions, right? So what are reparations, right? And we had that initial polling question, but really thinking about what are they? What does that mean? Why does America owe reparations to black community in America? What previous scholars have said about how reparations should be paid? And finally, what is Afrofuturism and how can this perspective further our understanding of how reparations should be executed? Next slide. So briefly, again, thinking about that first question, what are reparations? Well, just to provide a quick definition of it, according to the Oxford Dictionary on International Law um, and rep of reparations, reparations refers to the process and results of remedying the damage or harm caused by one group to another. The purpose of reparations is generally understood to reestablish the situation that existed before the harm occurred. And in thinking about the work that we hope to hear from, uh, hear about uh, from our esteemed panelist, uh, Laura Pitter, thinking about those five pillars of reparations outlined on uh, reparationslaw.com, uh, reparations, restitution, compensation, re rehabilitation, satisfaction, guarantees of non-repetition and justice for victims, right? So just kind of thinking about what that means, uh, what reparations are and how we should go about um, executing them. Uh, next slide, please. So again, why this conversation is foregrounded in this discussion, I guess, and why does America owe black people reparations, right? So we think back to slavery, which lasted from 1619 to 1865, and thinking about how that institution was used to build the wealth and status of America, again, while not crediting black people for those contributions 
or paying them for them, right? And then after you know the Emancipation Proclamation and, and slavery was formally abolished, we still had the convict lease system that took place during Reconstruction era in which black lives were criminalized and, and, and pe black people were put in jail and forced back into these plantation-like uh, systems where they were again continue forced uh, uh, to produce for this country without being paid for, their, for those contributions, right? And we have the Jim Crow laws that I'm sure we all have heard about, which were designed to oppress Black people at every at every turn, right? Denying them the economic access that they were, you know, that they needed to to further their to further their lives outside of outside of slavery, and, and just really uh, acting as just a hindrance to any kind of forward progress for the Black community. And today we see kind of the the the, the reconfiguration of the convict lease system with today's system, right? With the prison industrial complex and how with the war on drugs and, and, and Clinton's stop and frisk rule and, and just the state sanctioned violence that continues to happen against black communities in which we're again forced to be uh, overpopulate these jails and work essentially for pennies on the dollar to again provide the wealth um, for this country. And so uh, next slide, please. When we're thinking about when we're thinking about all these different things and how America has continued uh, to, to, to create systems to uh, exploit and, and oppress Black people, we come to this realization that the demand for reparations is not just about slavery. It's about the centuries worth of exploitation and subjugation that Black communities have faced and continue to face in America today. Next slide. So, so what have previously scholars uh, said about reparations. Uh, I wanna be clear in saying that this is not a new conversation. This is one that's been going on uh, uh, long before I was here. And so when thinking about James Foreman and the Black Manifesto, Religion and Re Racism and Reparation, which was a document that was produced in the 1960s, he claimed that the government owed $500 million to the Black community to be used to, uh, um, for different projects as, um, as it relates to community building and city building and, and just using that money to advance the community, right? In 1972, the Republic of New Africa with this anti-depression plan, right, called for the allocation of land where Black people voted for independence, as well as the repayment of $300 billion, right, to Black people in America, right? So that number went from $500 million to $300 billion in, in 1972. Furthermore, when at the turn of the millennium, we have more scholars contribute to this discussion um, with um, Abdul Akilamat, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And um, in his article, Rethinking Reparations, Rebuilding, Reform, and Revolution, in which he outlined five distinct points of how we can execute reparations in America, right? One, he declared that we have a demand for back pay for slavery. Two, he said we demand an apology. Three, we demand a new official record of history. And four, we demand a multicultural sphere. And so moving away from just these, these monetary um, um, claims or the monetary demands and thinking about how reparations could be a means to, to undo all the harm that's been done to the black community over the last few centuries. Um, we have Roy Brooks in 2004, who suggests this new model, the atonement model, which he suggests that reparations is, again is not just about repayment, but it's also about the apology and the undoing of the psychological trauma that black people have faced in this country for well over uh, three or four centuries. And finally, we have today, and, and I'm glad uh, to be able again to just be in the presence of, of our esteemed panelist, Laura Pitter, who is doing work, uh, excuse me, not Laura Pitter, Camilla Brooks, who is doing work uh, with the California Task Force on Reparations, in which their task is, is to think about how reparations should be executed, right? Who deserves them? Who is owed them? And, and how much? And what, do they, and what do they look like? And so this slide here is just to show you all that reparations conversation is ongoing. And, and it's not one that has, is, is relatively new. It's one that we, we must, as a society, continue to contribute to um, in, in order to produce restorative justice. Uh, next slide, please. So considering this, considering kind of giving a kind of a basis or a fundamental um, um, history of the reparations discussion, my research really makes an intervention with, with the implication or I guess the, the um, engaging with Afrofuturistic literature, right? So how does Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism, excuse me, um, uh, contribute to this conversation? And to provide just a brief little uh, um, definition, Afrofuturism elevates the past and the future to create better conditions for the present generation of Black people through the use of technology, um, often presented through art, music, and literature. And so when, when we apply this Afrofuture lens 
to this, the conversation of, conversation of reparations, we're really, we come with two points that my research really focus, uh, focuses on. One, it forces us to think about reparations in a way in which we as a people have ownership of our own resources, can establish our own social and political systems, and can express our culture and accurately represent our history. And two, Afrofuturism provides an opportunity for the Black community to achieve complete liberation um, from the white supremacist structure that has often underlined our government. And so um, uh, when thinking about this, it's not just thinking about reparations in terms of, okay, you hand me a check and we move on and we don't talk about race. It's more so about how these, how reparations can be used to further our society into the future. Into the future. Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. So in closing, considering you know, this kind of brief um, um, overlying uh, conversation, I would implore you all to just think about these few questions, right? What are your own thoughts on reparations, having heard this, right? Um, if, if reparations are to be executed, um, uh, should we imply, should we, should we use some of the work that these previous scholars have, have, have kind of outlined for us? Or should we think about reparations in a more Afrofuturistic um, lens or from an Afrofuturistic standpoint? And finally, what would our country look like once reparations are provided? And so I would implore you all throughout this presentation to just keep these questions in mind. And I think there's one uh, final polling question that's gonna be sent out right now, which is, should America pay for reparations? Thank you so much for your time. Awesome, thank you so much, Makai. I really, really appreciate that. And, and, and I know that that was a lot folks because uh, like like you said, this conversation has been going on. And so we're really trying to give you some things to, to kind of spark a thought process and give you some ideas to do some further research. Again, the reason why we called it 101, right? So, so you can go and, 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 and level up by the time we're ready to, to have our 201 conversation. Um, so, so thank you uh, very much uh, for that, <clears throat> Makai. That was, um, so I, I wanted to quickly point out and make this connection as far as generational, right? Makai represents our next generation. And the fact that this conversation has been going on for generations before, and, and um, I'm frequently reminded of the generational divide between Makai and I. So he is of that, that next generation to come behind me, right? And so uh, uh, to see the passion and, and, and the work that, that continues within our, our, our next generation on this issue is, is very important for me to make sure that we continue to, to, to make those connections. Um, and as we dive into to our panel, I wanna make sure that, that we set the frame here. Many of you all are aware of what the Coffee with the Black Guy platform is, but I have some guiding principles as we engage in a community conversation. Uh, it is really a, a genuinely so, supposed to be a community conversation. There's a lot of information. We uh, like to bring and invite experts to be able to, to, to engage their expertise in those communications. Uh, but it's really up to us as a community to talk through these things. And so some guiding principles in those uh, uh, conversations are, are, uh, are, are real basic of be respectful in your conversation, uh, be genuine, um, be willing to listen, be willing to feel something. Uh, and don't seek to dominate with your story. And so you're going to have an opportunity to either raise your hand um, here, raise your hand with the, the virtual the digital hand, um, and we can fold you into the conversation if you feel comfortable uh, highlighting yourself on, on camera, um, or feel free to utilize the chat function, and, and I'll try to monitor that uh, as with the, the team uh, in support as much as possible to fold that into the conversation as well. Um, but to help us with our conversation, like I said, to bring in some folks that have expertise, some folks that, that are doing the work, particularly in this area of reparations. I am so pleased and honored to be joined by two distinguished guests this evening. Uh, we have Camilla Moore, who's currently chairing uh, the California Reparations Task Force. It's the first of its kind in the nation. Um, and, and in addition to that, let's just say, uh, let's give her, her her flowers right now because she's with us off of 45 minutes off of uh, ending a two day uh, rep uh, reparations task force hearing uh, where they were talking about a lot of in depth and layered topics on reparations right and so uh, I i'd like to to definitely welcome her but give you a little bit about her background she's a, a reparatory justice scholar and an attorney uh, with a specialization in entertainment law and intellectual property transaction uh, she's done a lot of work 
uh, both domestically and, and uh, uh, internationally. Um, uh, done studied some issues on racial inequity in Brazil, uh, human rights works here in, in the United States down in the South in Alabama, uh, working with it, the remedy for indigenous black women affected by racialized gender violence in Papua New Guinea. Um, she earned her Juris Doctorate from Columbia Law School, Master's Degree in International Criminal Law from the University of Amsterdam, uh, and a Bachelor's Degree from you know, uh, UCLA. Uh, and so, you know, you, you hear how that goes all, all circle, uh, but all rooted right back here to help uh, the great state of California. And so, uh, uh, honored to be joined uh, by Camila Moore, uh, 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 Chair of the California Reparations Task Force, as well as Laura Pitter. Laura Pitter is uh, joining us uh, from the East Coast this evening, so I appreciate your, your accommodation there with the, the time difference, which can, can be a challenge. Uh, but Laura is the uh, Deputy Director of U.S. Program for Human Rights Watch. And um, if you, you're aware of this reparation conversation, Human Rights Watch has been doing a lot of work uh, in the research advocacy area of uh, reparations uh, uh, at the federal level, right? And so uh, it's important to be able to have some of that context here as well. Um, she's oversee oversees the work on domestic human rights issues in the United States um, with a focus on US criminal legal systems and racial justice. Uh, prior to that position, she uh, served as a National Security Council for Human Rights Watch's US program and is, has conducted human rights investigations all over the United States, the Middle East, Central Asia, Europe, um, and an extensive advocacy uh, before the governments in the United States and Europe. Um, I, well, we tap in here because she's a former journalist, uh, but she was on the, the, the camera side of things, uh, co covering a lot of the, the things that were happening um, around the world for uh, for both, well, also writing for, for both Reuters as well as Time Magazine, but connecting it, pull, again, pulling it back full circle. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, and a master's from Columbia University, as well as a law uh, degree from the University of San Francisco. And so uh, you're hearing how things weave in together. We are one global community. It's an honor to be joined in conversation. Uh, Makai is still here as well, so if there's questions about his uh, presentation, make sure you feel free to, 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 to chime in on that as well. Uh, but I'd like to kind of get started knowing that, that, that uh, Camilla is right off of the tail end of this, this uh, task force hearing. The, here a little bit uh, to kind of recap where we are in California right now in this conversation of reparations uh, from somebody leading the troops in the trenches. Yeah, sure. Um, so as you just stated, uh, the California Reparations Task Force met again uh, this month. Uh, so yesterday uh, we had um, presentations from expert witnesses like um, Nkechi Taifa and Ms. Uh, Ajoa Ayatoro, um, who are reparations experts and scholars. Um, and they gave a historical overview of the reparations movement um, in the United States. Um, and they also gave their opinions and insights on the question of who should be eligible for reparations. Um, we also heard from um, Professor Mary Frances Berry, who wrote a book called My Face is Black is True about Callie House, which is one of the first known, um, she was um, born into slavery um, and she was known to be an ex-slave reparations advocate. Um, advocating for pensions or reparations for newly emancipated slaves. Uh, we also heard from people like Chad Brown, who is a grassroots organizer, and he gave a presentation about some of the grassroots work around um, state-based and other forms of reparations advocacy. Um, but more of a high-level update because, you know, as we did discuss on um, those issues today, we've been meeting since June of 2021. The California Reparations Task Force. And uh, we've held a series of meetings on substantive topics ranging and starting from uh, the transatlantic slave trade, um, acknowledging that as one of the you know, most horrendous um, um, eras of history or moments in history, um, moving on to the institution of slavery and the impetus and implications of the great migrations, right? Acknowledging that Many Black Californians descend from folks who are enslaved um, in the South and had to move from the South for different reasons, um, particularly as internal 
refugees fleeing racial terror um, and other forms of racial violence. Um, we also held uh, um, reparations hearings on more contemporary harms facing Black Californians um, as it relates to environmental racism, education segregation, racism and banking, wealth tax and labor, and other areas as well. And we invited experts and people to provide personal testimony as it relates to those topics as well. We also held hearings on issues surrounding gentrification, homelessness, um, and infrastructure issues. Um, we held another hearing on art, sports, and culture, and you know, bringing in folks to provide expert and personal testimony as it relates to anti-Black discrimination in those fields as well. And in January, we held hearings on uh, anti-Black discrimination in technology, as well as um, a series of panels on health, whether it be public health, mental health, um, and physical health. And then of course, I, I gave you an update on um, the meeting that we had yesterday and today. Um, and so um, what do we have planned next, right? So for the March meeting, we're going to, um, continue our discussion on who should be eligible for reparations. Uh, the task force is somewhat split on the issue of that question. Um, and so we're going to have a full day in March to, to, to discover and discuss amongst ourselves that question and uh, potentially get to a vote on that, that question in March. We're also going to um, have a series of panels on the criminal legal system ranging from the school to prison pipeline, um, uh, the history of the war on drugs and the history of policing and mass incarceration in this country, then also anti-Black bias or hate crimes. And then April, um, we're going to have um, a series of, of panels on education. And then we're also going to discuss amongst the nine member task force, this 1000 page report that we're planning to publish in June of this year that comprises all of the information that we've learned about all these areas that I just informed you all of that we've been discussing since June of last year. Um, and so I just wanted to give that high level overview of, of where we've been, where we are today and where we're going in the near future. Mm -hmm. My goodness. So as I was uh, tuning into some of these hearings, I, I, I'm. I'm Part of my personal hope is that at the end of this, somebody gives you an honorary doctorate for having to run this because the amount of information that is coming in on this topic and the deep, deep levels that the experts and community members come with in this conversation, I mean, it, it is, uh, uh, you know, a, a PhD level uh, dive into uh, um, this this topic of reparations, and and you heard Camilla point out that uh, you know the, these the, these uh, task force hearings are public, open to the public, uh, public comment. I think there was uh, over twenty folks that, that didn't get a chance to provide public comment today because there were folks that want to, and so uh, that should be even more next time, right? They're providing more time for comment, but at the same time, it's important to hear from as many voices and diverse voices on this issue, uh, because it's, it's an important topic. And there's no point, personally, I see there's no point in us getting to the to the end of, okay, here's the plan of reparations, when the majority of our society is, is feeling resentful because of that. And so bringing everyone along during the process is part of that. And, and, and uh, part of that, that, that public comment, uh, you know, I, I did tune in a little bit yesterday, and, and uh, Laura uh, Pitter joined in and, and, and shared some support for um, uh, for the work that's going on with this. And, and, and you know, Laura has been kind of focused on this from, from a bit more of a national and international perspective, uh, but being able to bring that context uh, to our to our conversation this evening, I, I want to give Laura a few moments to kind of give us a brief little overview of some of the work that she's been involved with on this issue. Uh, and and as uh, as you're hearing this, if questions pop up again, feel free to utilize your hand function uh, as well as the chat. So uh, Laura, if you can share with us a little bit about the, uh, your work. Thank you. Well, it's really an honor to be with you all this evening for me. So um, it was. Also an honor to tune into the task force hearings that went on the past couple of days. I uh, second the co congratulations to Camilla for uh, the way she's been sharing those and uh, what I observed on during the task force, because it was very impressive. And um, I know it's not 
easy work. Um, so Human Rights Watch is an international uh, nonprofit uh, independent organization, and we monitor human rights violations in more than 90 countries, including the United States. And, uh, you know, we have, we took a position on the need to provide reparations for in the enslavement of African Americans and legacy that followed uh, more than 20 years ago in support for, uh, for that, those measures. Uh, but I would say we really deepened our advocacy on it in about three years ago. And ever since then, we've been working with groups that have been, um, you know, at the forefront of this for decades uh, to try to elevate and get support for the same type of commission that's been established in California, which is way ahead of things at the federal level, for a similar type of commission to be established at the federal level. And we've been doing that through advocating for support for a bill called HR 40. And um, you know, about two years ago, that bill got the first hearing that um, it, had, it had ever had. It had been introduced over the course of the last 30 years by Representative John Conyers every congressional session for the past 30 years. Um, so that was a historic to just get a hearing about it. And then this congressional session, HR 40, was voted out of the Judiciary Committee. And it's, it's now, you know, been sitting in a posture where we've been urging where House leadership really just has to make a decision to bring the floor, bring the bill to the floor for a vote, because it has more support than it's ever had in, in its history. Um, enough votes, we believe, for it to pass should the House leadership get behind it. Um, but they have yet to bring the bill to the floor for a vote. And it would establish a commission very similar to the one that California has established. And um, you know, so we've been working for that, that, you know, should that bill not pass, there's also an avenue to establish the same kind of a commission by an executive order. Um, so one way or another, we're, we're just pushing for that commission to get set up. Um, so it's necessary, it's long overdue, and um, it's been really an honor to be working on that for, for these past few years. We've also done a lot of work on in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, trying to, you know, urge reparations for uh, the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, We've written several reports on it and done a lot of advocacy on that. Um, and there's connections to reparations for that massacre uh, that happened and has not been accounted for. And there's, uh, you know, now just hasn't been accounted for for a hundred years. They've not provided any reparations to the descendants or survivors of that. Um, there's three living survivors remaining who, um, you know, we've been working with and trying to draw attention to the issue and um, work on getting reparations to that community. Happy to answer any questions. Indeed, thank you, thank you um, for for that. And and yeah, you know, I and hopefully he feels comfortable speaking up later. But we do have someone. I saw someone on the call earlier who who has a direct connection to the Tulsa uh, race massacre. Uh, who I've met with uh, from our region. Um, um, but yeah, that, I mean, so there's a lot of work that's going on and has gone on in um, to, to the, the, the era of reparations. And I know that there's been some stuff that's happened at the local level as well. Has anybody really been tuning in to, to I, I've seen that I think Evanston, Illinois is, is probably most in, uh, advanced in that issue. Uh, I think back in 2019, they made a vote on that. And um, in recent weeks, uh, um, some uh, recipients of their lottery-based reparation system for descendants of slaves that live in Evanston, Illinois, um, have started to get notification that they, they've won that, right? Um, and, and what that looks like, if I recall, is about $25,000 for, uh, for a house down payment for um, remodeling, um, that, that, you know, mortgage payments, that kind of stuff. Uh, how, how much of a model does that provide for, for where we're heading in the conversation of reparation? I, yeah, I wanted to maybe clarify, um, based on, on what I know from Evanston, it's not necessarily um, based on on lineage per se. I know that that's getting into the weeds, but I think the people <laughs> yeah. who qualify for Evanston are you know, all Black residents, depending on, um, uh, well, the first two criteria, it's like, um, 
it's based on like, were you um, a, a resident in Evanston during a particular time period where like redlining was rampant or where you can prove um, you were impacted by redlining or during a certain period of time, but then other black residents may be eligible as well after 1965, I believe. So it's, it's race-based. Um, I just wanted to make that quick clarification. <laughs> Yeah, no, and and that <laughs> that's on point with where where that conversation has been locally, absolutely. Um, but, and, but one of the things I also point out for that is is okay, that's twenty five thousand dollars. The average cost of a house in Evanston, uh, Evanston is uh, well over uh, half a million dollars, right? And so if you if you go with the you know the what does it say six percent average is what the, your down payment is, your down payment like that doesn't even cover the down payment on the average cost of a house in Evanston. Um, and so keeping that in mind, is that, is, you know, it, it, is that equitable? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's better than nothing. It's a start, but I think it's definitely worth uh, diving into saying, is, is, that, is that really where we need to be? Um, and I do see some questions here. Maybe we can, can dive into this a little bit about parallels of payments to other uh, demographics, such as uh, Native American tribes. Um, um, and the precedent that has been that there is elsewhere uh, for reparations. I mean, well, we know. I know that there's a, a big precedent set by the reparations that were provided through the Civil Liberties Act that was signed by President Reagan uh, and enacted in 1988, and it provided reparations. I think twenty thousand dollars to Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II. And uh, I mean, that was one of the impetuses for uh, introducing HR 40 was once that was established and once it was granted for Japanese Americans, um, you know, that's when the movement picked up for pr the provision of reparations for African Americans. And uh, the Japanese American community has been incredibly supportive um, and um, of, uh, HR 40 and the need for repar reparative justice. Um, so that you know that's that's one precedent, but um, there there are other precedents. Uh, it was the Rosewood um, the Rosewood uh, uh, reparations that were provided provided for the Rosewood massacre. They were relatively small, and they were um, you know just provided to. Um, for, they were just for, for scholarships, and they they were there were there were a lot of there were some issues with the with the way that was distributed. Um, but I'm sure Camilla, you are more expert on uh, the other types of um, remedies that have been provided around the country. There's a there's a large number of local initiatives that have happened across the country, especially over the past decade. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm really just familiar with Evanston, Rosewood, and Tulsa as like primary domestic examples. There's a, a recent put for the like local reparations commissions and initiatives on the municipal level uh, following Evanston. So I know there is a coalition of mayors. Um, the Los Angeles mayor is, is one of them in my city who have committed to doing like city-based reparation missions. So there's a few cities in, in the country like LA and Boston um, and some other cities um, that are organizing on that city level. So far on the state level, right? I think California, well, I know California is the only um, state-based reparations or any, yeah, state-based reparations commission happening right now. I know New Jersey, is trying um, really hard um, to get their commission off the ground. And I've been talking with them um, and Michigan as well. Um, on the international level, I'm sure like Laura also knows, you know, there's there's definitely some precedents for reference on the international level. Um, you know, you can cite the Mau Mau Rebellion um, and them getting, you know, aid from um, the British. Um, there's so many other examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Peru, um, you know, following the recommendation of the Truth Commission, the government provided financial compensation. Um, of course, in, you know, the 50s, Germany agreed to pay reparations to the victim of the uh, Holocaust, and those are still being processed today. Um, you know, there's a, one of the reasons why we felt, you know, like it was important to get involved is because the, the, the idea for the need for reparations and uh, is well-established principle of international human rights law for 
gross human rights violations, which are obviously uh, enslavement, enslavement was, um, but not just uh, addressing those past harms, but the contemporary ones that stem from the legacy of that as well. Yeah, no, that, that that's very good. And and I, I know that, you know, a lot of the the misunderstanding about reparations is that it's just a check. And so if we can dive in a little bit more about what that wraparound would be, right? What could that look like and what have past models been? Uh, I, and again, I, I do uh, uh, know that folks keep bringing up uh, Native American tribes. And I, know, I, I did hear that there have been several if I recall the number, again, these things just stick in my head. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But about like six tribes is about how the, uh, the number that have been paid reparations from the US government um, based on some of the, 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 the uh, harms that have been done specifically um, um, pro the, 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 the loss of property. Um, so I know that that's been some of, of, of what it has, has been done. Um, but yeah, can we, can we talk a little, a little bit about, about that? Um, well, well, I mean, definitely there, there've been a variety of, um, settlements with, with tribes throughout U.S. history. Uh, many of them unsatisfactory and, um, uh, you know, many of them have, have caused significant problems. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, there is at least been an attempt which we, we, we don't have in this context, is, hasn't been any attempt even um, to, to address the, the harm stemming from, from slavery. Um, but there's, there, there are a variety of um, you know, settlements that have been made between the US government and various uh, Native American tribes throughout history. Yeah, to add to that, I was gonna say, just being in conversation with like, Native and Indigenous American communities. When I was in law school, um, I, I participated in a Native American Law Student Association moot court, and I also served on their board just as an ally. And I know a lot of them kind of like reject the notion or the concept that Native Americans received reparations. I think um, Laura was, you know, rightfully used the term settlements because, you know, through negotiations, through treaties, uh, through the treaty making process, they have been able to receive some sort of, of, of compensation, but I, don't, I think they reject the notion that it's reparations because when you really look at the harm done to, their, to them, it's, just, it's an extreme loss of land. That, that type of harm is irreplaceable and a lot of them feel that reparations is ill-suited to really address that harm, which you know gets the conversations around land back and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, some tribes have even refused the, the settlement funds that have been provided because they want their land back. So uh, it's, you know, different type of, you know, similar situation, but uh, at least there's been some attempt to, to address those claims. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. And um, I see that there's a question here about a definition of black. And I think Camilla, this kind of gets at that lineage uh, the lineage uh, issue, right? And, and um, so the question is, is what is the definition of black when we're talking about reparations? Uh, kind of basically harkening uh, uh, back to a black in Indiana uh, about a black woman who in 1821 sought to win reparations in Indiana. Um, many black people had to become white. Um, so it's reflected, remedy flood. So yeah, that, that is part of the conversation. And then really like that, that, that issue of do you, you know, as you, you, some of the nuance in this conversation that you've heard thus far is a little bit about um, kind of as Camilla pointed out in Evans, Evanston, it, it's a more race-based program. And so those are black people who live in that city who can, who entered a lottery to be able to get reparations, right? And, and the conversation that, that a lot of the topic was yesterday and today was around the issue of, well, do you use it based on race or do you, you, do you pursue this based on lineage? How can you tell or can, can you prove that you are the direct descendant of an enslaved American, right? And, and so um, that's kind of where that nuance gets into. Um, and, and, and what made it really clear for me is, so on the lineage argument, Barack Obama would not be eligible for reparation payments because he is a son of an, of an African immigrant and not a direct 
uh, descendant of an enslaved American, right? But somebody who has, who is a black American who has been here for multiple generations, whose family has been connected to uh, uh, chattel slavery um, and slavery by any other name, sharecropping, whatever you want to call it, like connections to those systems, um, you know, that, that's it, that is a, its own classification. And so that's kind of the nuance in the conversation in California uh, uh, currently. Yeah, I can jump in there. And, and before I touch on that, like lineage versus race-based standard, which I think you um, eloquently kind of hinted at, I wanted to address like more succinctly the, the uh, question in the chat about, um, it gets to like passing, right? Where there's this, uh, an era in history where Black Americans by virtue of European racial admixture, um, some, some, were able to pass as white. And I think her question is like, that fits into the, the conversation of who define, what is the definition of black? I wanted to bring up uh, William A. Darity and, and, and Kristen Mullen's book, um, From Here to Equality, Reparation for Black Americans in the 21st Century, only because, well, it's a good book, but then they also lay out like um, a two-pronged test for who should be eligible for reparations on the federal level. And so in their book, they lay out this two-pronged test as follows. So the first factor would be, can you trace your lineage to an enslaved ancestor in the United States? And then the second prong would be an identity standard. Have you been identifying yourself as Black or African American for a certain amount of years? And so to that question, right? So someone who's been passing for a certain amount of years and you know, um, has children who also can be passing or white presenting um, under Darity's two-pronged test. If they haven't been identifying themselves as Black or African American for a certain amount of years, um, but they can trace their lineage to an enslaved ancestor, then that means that they're not eligible for reparations under the federal level in Darity's eyes, right? But just to bring this all back. Uh, the, the, the task force invited uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, who is the Dean of UC Berkeley Law, to come in and give his um, insight in terms of constitutional law as to um, what would withstand constitutional muster, whether it be on the Prop 209 level in California. Is this a national conversation, by the way? Because I don't want to get in the weeds of Prop 209. I can just stick to... Yes and no. I see that there's people from from across the country. Um, so, but but we're 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 a local community conversation, and so okay. like let's keep it anchored in in California for sure. Okay, great. So essentially, Erwin Chemerinsky he came to the task force um, because we are gridlocked right now in terms of a task force, in terms of the question of who should be eligible for reparations. Some people on the task force believe that the community of eligibility for reparations should be race-based, where all Black people, regardless of ethnic or even immigrant origin, should or should be eligible for reparations. And then you have some people on the task force who believe in a more lineage-based standard. Um, if you can trace your ancestry to an enslaved person in the United States specifically, then you should be eligible for reparations. And then there's task force members who are undecided and, and in between. Um, and so there, there should be some, some, some medium, right? Um, and so we invited Erwin Chemerinsky as, as, as a constitutional law expert to kind of give us some um, insight as to what would hold up in law potentially. And he just kind of just gave his sober opinion and said, you know, given that the US Supreme Court is, is, is conservative, they're taking up these two affirmative action cases. Um, he, he thinks it's likely that affirmative action, uh, race conscious admissions programs will be struck down as unconstitutional um, because he thinks that, you know, any race-based um, programs would be highly suspect to the court and thus thrown out. And so he was advocating for a more lineage-based standard because it gets away from questions of race. Um, and so, sorry, I, I kind of lost my train of thought. That's kind of where we are right now. Um, and we delayed the vote. So we're going to vote on, on the question of who should be eligible. Should we do a race-based standard or a lineage-based standard? And then from there, whatever we choose, then we have even more complex 
or granular questions about eligibility, like California residency and, you know, picking a particular time period from which, you know, eligibility starts and, and all that. So thank you. <laughs> no, no, that's, 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 that's very helpful. Um, I, I see some of the, 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 the context here, and I want to loop back to something that Mackay brought in in his uh, presentation. And Laura, if you can pick up on that, that five pillars of refer, reparations. We talked about I, a lot of times when people hear the term reparations, they think it's just a check, right? And so beyond that, what is reparations? Um, Mackay, do you want to, do you want, should I, do you want me to take that or you want to? I mean, I briefly, I briefly introduced it, but you know, it's, <laughs> Is definitely within the in, within the expertise of, of you know the work that you're doing. So I'll let you <laughs> let you tackle that one. So I'm seeing yeah questions in the chat with the difference between settlements and reparations, or is and is our reparations or our settlements restorative justice? And the whole idea behind reparations is that is an attempt to make you know it, the in, individuals whole stemming from the harm. Um, but it is there are you know different pillars of it. And so a complete, you know, restorative justice or reparations program would involve measures that, uh, you know, help restore the situation that existed before the wrongful act, you know, was committed, such as like the restoration of liberty or the employment or return of a place of residence, for example. Um, and then another pillar of it is compensation. So monetary payment for uh, any any economically accessible damage arising from the violation, um, you know, rehabilitation, which could include medical and psychological care as well as legal and social services, and then there's satisfaction, which you know includes a range of truth-telling measures, you know, statements aimed at ending ongoing abuses, at commemorations or tributes, you know, pre preservation of historical memory, for example. Um, and then an important part of it, too, is guarantees of non-repetition. So that would include institutional and legal reforms um, that would uh, prevent the same kind of abuses from happening, happening again. So more systemic changes. So, you know, reparations can take a variety of forms uh, and not, you know, monetary compensation is one of them. But there are a number of ways to try to address the harm and not all the harms are the same. So, um, you know, in order to you know, institute a whole program that's that's complete and that is restorative, it would, you know, ideally include a variety of measures. Does that help? Explain? Yes, so that, that, that's very helpful. And, and, and I saw some folks pointing, pointing out that it, you know, some acknowledgement of the wrong as well. And, and, and you know, to some extent that has happened, at the, that's in congressional record. The acknowledgement of the wrong, the apology, that's in congressional record. Um, but that without like that's only like that, that's that's a half-baked pie right and so that without the financial without these other avenues without that full package it really doesn't have the same weight right and so uh, i think that's worth worth pointing out um i also want to point out briefly that uh, uh you know i again y'all that are on here know i used to work for a legislator so connecting that legislative link all of our local legislators in the santa barbara ventura county area voted in favor of AB 3121. Um, and so uh, both your assembly member and your, your assembly member then, now Senator, and my former boss, the Senator, who's now retired, uh, voted for this. She actually chaired the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, that, that heard uh, the bill as it was going through. Um, kind of on that legislative link, you know, I, I really, I, I, I'm, I know folks keep referencing Erwin Shimerinsky, uh, but I, I want to point out that you know we have 40 senators in the state of California. Um, since I've known and heard of Erwin, since in the 10 years I worked in the legislature, he was always referred to as the 41st senator um, because of his knowledge, because of what he brings to the institution, and he's looked that way for, uh, as a constitutional scholar. And so to be able to have his expertise chime in on this uh, really brings uh, uh, some some some. I don't know, context that, that uh, uh, you know, helps move this conversation forward in a, in a useful way, although sometimes still divisive. Um, Can I add to that point? Because it reminded please. me of something. So in terms of Proposition 209, as you know, um, that bans affirmative action or race 
um, uh, conscious programs in the avenues or um, of education, contracting and employment. And so Dean Chemerinsky in his ex expert testimony in the to the task force also stated, um, um, if, there, if reparations are race-based, um, not only would you have to deal with equal protection or strict scrutiny concerns on the federal level, because like I said before, um, the US Supreme Court um, and the federal courts are highly suspect of race-based uh, uh, programs, even to solve race-based harms. Um, with Proposition 209, he, he stated pretty much the same thing. If um, you know the task force comes up with rate, uh, reparations proposals on the basis of race in, um, in education, in employment, and in, co in contracting, those programs will automatically be struck down as unconstitutional. Um, um, given that Prop 209 was like a ballot measure. Um, and so that's another reason why he advocated for lineage based in those avenues of education, employment and contracting. But if, if the reparations proposals are outside of those three areas in the state of California, race based could potentially um, um, be okay on the state level, but then you would still open yourself up to federal, um, to a federal challenge potentially because race is still highly suspect on the federal level. Indeed, indeed. and, and, and th this being such a layered issue like that, you know, th um, we were kind of in, in our prep uh, before we, we started this evening, we were kind of discussing how during these hearings uh, in California about the California task force work, you've got people chiming in from across the country because everywhere in the country is paying attention to what California is doing on this because California, it's known to uh, the way California goes, the rest, so goes the rest of the country, the nation, right? And so there's a lot of folks that are tapping in from uh, New Jersey, from North Carolina, from Maryland, uh, from, from the South, uh, uh, down in Alabama and Mississippi who are paying attention to what's going on here in California. And so, yes, this conversation about reparations may seem a bit, disconnected given that California was founded, it, you know, uh, was never a, a slave holding state. But understanding um, the way I've always tried to understand and explain it is the, the whole notion of economy of scale. California is a big behemoth of a state. And the way that we go sets the way of a lot of things. The greatest example of that is seatbelts. Car companies didn't want to put seatbelts in cars until California law said, okay, we need to put seatbelts in cars. And so it no longer made sense to produce cars only for California with seatbelts and then the rest of the nation without. And so that's the kind of mindset that goes into uh, this conversation about reparations here in, in, in the state of California. Um, I saw uh, Dr. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, I'll, I'll wait. Go ahead. No, no, it go was ahead, go ahead. California. Because, yeah, I think that's an early question that we tackled in, in one of our first hearings at the Reparations Task Force, because the first question people have when they find out California has a Reparations Task Force, they say, why? <laughs> because California was a free state or it was admitted to the Union as a free state. It, it, a lot of people don't know the early history of California. And, and while it is true that California was admitted to the Union as a free state in 1850, just two short years later in 1852, they implemented uh, or enacted a Fugitive Slave Act. Um, folks, a lot of folks don't know that a lot of white Southerner, Southerners during the gold rush period like flocked to California with their um, enslaved um, Africans or black people um, uh, to mine for gold. And um, a lot of those black people who were enslaved, once they got to California, they, they realized like, okay, I could be free. <laughs> so a lot of them tried to escape their masters. And some of them who did escape, um, Robert Perkins is, is an example of that. You can check out ACLU's Northern California's podcast, Go Chains, where him and three other enslaved black people, black men escaped um, and then did their own gold mining enterprise um, and they were very successful up to a certain point until that Fugitive Slave Act was enacted. Um, then they were rounded up and taken back to the South with their master um, back to be enslaved. So um, there's little, there's a lot of different stories like that. And so California, like I said, while I've been to the Union as a free state, um, was definitely complicit in maintaining um, and perpetuating the system of slavery in this country. And, and no, I thank you so much for pointing that out. And for those of us here in Santa Barbara, let's not get too complacent thinking, oh, Santa Barbara didn't have that issue because there's research that shows that that, that, that story that you just heard 
rings true for Santa Barbara as well. There were black folks that came here with their uh, um, the, the folks that owned them in the South and they came out here, then they were deeded property uh, and, and that property is no longer in their hands. And so there has been some local work on researching reparations uh, in Santa Barbara. Uh, it's slow moving, it's a challenge, uh, but I do know that, that, that some of that, that work uh, is, is going on. And it's important that we know that it, it's, it's a, a, a statewide issue and also that concept of you know, things happen in our community, but we're connected to, to, the, to the bigger thing, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I just kind of offer that for, for a little bit of, of context um, as well. Um, I, I wondered, I wondered, Camilla or Makai, I don't know if you, either of you could speak to this, you know, without taking a position or anything, can, can you sort of explain? I, I understand that it may be more simple to go with lineage, but I'm wondering what the arguments are for, or if you could speak to what the arguments are for a broader view. You know, my understanding is that it is that, you know, the harms did not end when slavery ended, that they extended into, you know, Jim Crow, convict leasing, um, you know, uh, segregation, redlining, and so many impediments that were a legacy of slavery, uh, you know, impacted Black people more broadly. But you know, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, uh, again, going back yeah, to six. I need is water. Sorry about that. Uh, I think going back to kind of that presentation that we had, we see again that, you know, again, a lot of, a lot of the... Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Again, a lot of the conversations on reparations um, initially, when we first think about it, it is based um, again on that initial era of slavery, right? But we see again that there's, you know, America has, has constantly found ways to continue to oppress and exploit Black people, and they've changed their system. They've got a little bit more creative to where now we have the prison industrial complex, where you know people are they're again over criminalizing Black people and, and, and subjecting them to kind of the same uh, conditions that they faced during slavery. And so it's not. And, and, and I briefly want to go back to a point um, that you made, Laura, about the guarantees of non-repetition. I think that's so that's so critical because. What it really shows us is that reparations and our and our call for reparations is not just about you know undoing it is about undoing the wrongs of the past, but it's also guaranteed that once reparations are executed, we're not placed back into a system that's just going to continue the systems of oppression that that have persisted for so long. And so it's more so about institutional change and making sure that okay, you know, we 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 righted the wrongs that, that, that have taken place in the past but we're also not placing black people back into a system, back into a society that still devalues them, that still exploits them. And so um, from my understanding, you know, the broader lens of reparations is about that instant, that systemic change that you talked about in those, in those pillars there, so. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I think that's spot on. Um, you know, as a member of the task force, I'm totally open to, um, you know, either of the positions. Um, I think, I think for me, I think, you know, the, the insight and testimony from Chemerinsky, I think is, is, is insightful, uh, almost decisive for me, but to the point of guarantees of non-repetition, um, you know, and I also bring up section two of the 13th amendment that a lot of people don't know about. A lot of folks know about section one, which is, you know, that um, exception clause, if you're incarcerated, um, you can be in, uh, enslaved by virtue of being a uh, punished of a crime. Um, but then section two of the 13th amendment actually empowers Congress uh, to um, eradicate the vestiges and badges of, of slavery. And to me, how I interpret that, you know, that that amendment wasn't in, was enacted right right out of the heels of the Civil War. So when they created that 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 amendment in that particular section, you know, it was with a particular I think lineage in mind. It's how do you eradicate the badges and incidents of the institution of slavery as it relates to the descendants or the group of people who were enslaved. <laughs> um, and so when it comes to guarantees of non-repetition, I think even with the lineage-based standard, you're able to get at the get at um, getting the state or the wrongdoer party to um, guarantee to stop harming 
um, um, by virtue of, of being specific and, and, and honing into the group that they have over time over history have harmed and then that has a reverberating effect if you if you guarantee the state to stop harming their original group that they have harmed over 400 years well that stops i think theoretically maybe materially um the harm um, um faced by other groups by virtue of sharing the same skin color indeed I, and i want to want to uh thank you all for that but i want to definitely touch on somebody pointed out in the chat that knowing your lineage is a privilege, right? Um, and being able to, to figure that out is, is, is a challenge within itself for Black folks. And, and a lot of times, you know, we, I hear that, but I challenge everything I hear too, right? Um, and so, yes, it, there, there's a, a limit to being able to track your lineage, but there's no, li there's no uh, limit to talking to your elders. Right. And just by having conversations with your elders, you will find out so much. Point in case, just having and listening to a conversation that my dad had, I found out that my family was connected to a property in Maryland that is now in historic preservation. And they used to live in the small house on the property. Right. And so as I put those pieces together and do more research, just based on that little nugget of listening to my elders, Right. I think that is, is, is something that can be learned from this is that, you know, we, we do have that at our disposal currently um, and, and, and make sure that we, we, we do that. And, and I saw that Jean pointed out that there is uh, the exhibit at the, the Melanin Gallery. I know there's particularly in Santa Barbara, there's been a lot of great research that's been done about black history here in town. Um, and that is connected with the Melanin Gallery. And thank you for the address, Jean. Uh, the check is in the mail, uh, 833 State Street. Um, um, and, and um, you know, I encourage you all to stop, stop by there and, and tap in um, to see, you know, kind of what the, uh, the Black community has been doing um, here in town. Um, so understanding that, that, that we're kind of rounding out on our time here, and, and it's been a, a long day for, for those of us in the reparations world, um, what, what are the next steps for folks who are just kind of tuning into the conversation? What can be done? Right. Um, I think that in some of the uh, 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 pieces that I've recently wrote, I, I pitched out this idea that, OK, yeah, we've had this conversation. But what if we had it like I've done this basic research in my family? What if there was a government office that hired the best researchers that once I had that information, I could go and the government and I say that the government, knowing that it's the um, uh, the Mormon church has a lot of that information, that lineage information, right? And so being able to have an office of people, experts that help with that connection and help do that work uh, uh, would be or could be an avenue to help connect this conversation of lineage. Um, looking at these five pillars of these different options that once you come out and your, your lineage is validated per se, um, you, know, you would have options potentially to be able to pursue uh, reparative justice uh, 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 based on that lineage. And so, you know, this conversation is, 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 is rolling down the hill, uh, but for folks that are tapping in, what are some things that, that, that we can do? I, I do wanna point out that, that Makai, I will plan to put your, uh, to be able to share uh, some of your research uh, with, with folks who've attended, as well as many of the links that were provided uh, in the chat here. Uh, so folks can do more, more research. Uh, but just wanted to hear if, if you all have any tips or suggestions for folks. No, I'll just say please stay tuned for our next meeting in March. Um, you know, we're going to discuss in length at least two, three hours uh, or more to the conversation on eligibility. And we're planning to hopefully, you know, invite genealogists uh, to help us with, with, with these questions. Um, maybe even DNA companies, you know, we're, we're, we don't know what we're going to do. We could do race space where these, these questions don't need to be answered or resolved. But if we do lineage based, um, you know, there's members on the task force like member Grills and member Bradford who, you know, ask for us to in, invite these people um, to answer questions. I think an outstanding question was what about, you know, black people who are in black Americans who are in, in the child welfare or foster youth system? How difficult will it be for them to, to trace their lineage under a lineage based standard, which is a very valid 
valid question. But my last comment to that, I think, is, is bringing back one of the, the pillars of, of international law, which is satisfaction, right? And to the point that you just raised, James, what if there was some government subsidized program. Um, and it, it gets to the comment in the chat, like tracing your genealogy and all this stuff, it can get really expensive. What if there's a government subsidized program that helped you know, Black Americans um, trace their lineage? Or in the case of a foster youth, you know, find their relatives through DNA testing? That could also speak to reparations in the form of satisfaction, because as we know, our lineage has been interrupted um and 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 violated in, in a lot of ways due to the transatlantic slave trade and the institution of slavery you know with the domestic slave trade where um people were ripped apart from their families so there might be black americans in another state that i could be related to and i have no idea <laughs> um because of the institution of slavery in this country uh, so i just also wanted to bring up how no, in the conversations around the community of eligibility, it, today in particular, it has really made me think very deeply about issues of genealogy and how that could even fit into the concept of, of a repertory justice under those pillars of, inter, of, of reparations and in international law. Thank you for that. If, if I, I'm gonna take an opportunity to make a plug for really uh, uh, supporting HR 40. Um, we have, I mean, we're gonna, put in the chat our take action page um, because we need a commission, you know, California is ahead, way ahead of, um, of the, uh, us at the federal, federal level. There's never been a full accounting at the federal level, not even uh, you know, any kind of real accounting at the federal level of uh, the enslavement era and the harms of, of slavery, as well as all the racist uh, policies, practices, you know, failure to carry out investigations into the terror lynchings, um, Jim Crow, segregation, um, redlining that followed uh, the emancip emancipation. So uh, we really need that, not just because um, it's, it's the necessary first step to uh, providing reparations, but also to educate the public about the need for this. Um, you know, California is ahead, but there are so many states and a lot of people in this country that still don't really understand why this is necessary. And a commission would be a part of that public education process and, um, you know, really is a necessary first step towards uh, the general uh, educating the American public about the need for this. So if you're um, in support of such measures, I urge you to take the action and urge House leadership to bring HR 40 to the floor for vote. It has a historic number of supporters now and we really could uh, make something happen. So that's my plug. Indeed, I, I thank, thank you for that. And I, and I think my plug is, is educate yourselves and each other, right? Uh, this is supposed to be a starter conversation. I, ignorance is, is not an option in this conversation. And so it's in, in incumbent upon us all as members of a global community to understand what this topic and issue is. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, really, you know, dive in, and and if it's if it's talking to people, if it's reading books, if it's learning more, uh, and even if you disagree, keep learning more. Um, the the whole concept of uh, of uh, uh, universal basic income. When I first heard about that, I was like, yeah, right, whatever. And then the more I did research and learned on it, and more time went, it was like. Well, yeah, I guess that that does work. And the research shows that it does work. And so sometimes the more you dive in and, and, and look at an issue and, and really examine it from varied perspectives, right? And I think that's the important part is, is really look at it, at it from the perspective of somebody, here I sit on Black History Month convening a conversation, educating my community about the wrongs that were done to my ancestors. Where does that make sense, right? But it's being done because if it's not us, then who? Right. And that's the kind of that's that's what we bring uh, uh, to this country time and time again throughout history. Right. And so I think it's important to understand and, and, and to tap into that and educate yourself. Uh, Camilla, I'm going to make a plug for the community listening sessions. I've heard uh, that that's part of the work that the task force is doing as well is making sure that we're not just talking about these con this conversation about reparations within the Pan-African movement. Right. We're talking about this in our our entire state of California and our entire nation, right? And so uh, really making sure that, that you're tapping into the various opportunities 
uh, that there are to, to tap in with the task force. There's community listening sessions to get feedback from folks uh, who feel different ways about it. This is uh, the, the transcript here and some of the feedback during this conversation, I think, uh, 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 really checks, checks, checks a box for that, but needs to continue to amplify throughout the state. Um, any, any other thoughts? I just wanted to say a question was, is there a California type of HR 40? Do we have a California assembly member or Senator championing this effort? I probably should have clarified at the beginning, AB 3121 is a legislative bill. It is actually based in part on HR 40, um, but it's, it's already law. It was signed into law by governor Gavin Newsom um, in September, 2020. Um, and the nine member task force um, started meeting in June of 2021. So this is already law. And, you know, that's why it's so historic that, you know, we're the first in the nation, you know, the federal government still hasn't um, acted, um, you know, and Laura, it, Laura talked about that. And so, uh, yes, yeah, federal that's why we needed at the federal level. So yeah. our, uh, it's Sheila Jackson Lee, who is the lead sponsor of the federal HR 40 bill. Um, but uh, Senator, Senator some, Representative Barberly is also a, a very key ally so uh, from California. So, and, and, and Dr. Shirley Weber, the author of the California Bill AB 3121, is now Secretary of State, right? And so um, she, she created the bill uh, when she was in the Assembly. It, there's, uh, um, you know, now that she's Secretary of State, talking about that bill to other legislators in other states and federal uh, lawmakers, is is much easier and, and it's my understanding that those conversations uh, are happening um and so it's it's good to um uh good to hear hear that um in, in closing i i, I kind of want to also point out uh you know big thanks to 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 our sponsors um one in particular wealth management strategies right why is it important to have that as part of this conversation well because if, you, if, if, if reparations comes in the form of checks, it's not gonna be any good. Let's, let's look at Evanston, right? So you get your $25,000, you, you take your check, you say, I'm gonna go buy a house. Where does that money go? That money goes to the owner of that property, right? <laughs> and so is that a smart use of that reparations funds? I don't know, right? But when, when I, what I know from what, you know, what Guy and Wealth Management Strategy does is looks at this whole concept of generational wealth. And this whole conversation of reparations is tied to that concept of generational wealth and looking at the reason that there is an economic disparity in our country that's divided along the race line is because of that foundational wealth building mechanism, which was free labor. Right, and so when we, we that, that's kind of the context that we bring uh, to this. We're in the weeds. We dove in the weeds on this issue, and and that's where folks should be. But to be able to pull back and understand the why, I think, is extremely valuable in in why we need to continue to have these uh, conversations. And so uh, um, I, I thank you all uh, for that. Oh yes, and if you support. You heard what I used to do. I used to work for, for, for a state, state uh, senator, right? And so now I'm doing this. This is my community offering full time. So if you support these conversations to continue, continue on, not just on reparations, but on a variety of issues, I'd like for you to help, help us out. Contribute to the work that we're doing by helping continue these conversations. It's important work. Uh, it's important work that's gonna continue. Not just today, I, I think if you've read the article, the, the conversation on reparations, when I first came up to, uh, two years ago, I, I, I'm losing track of time. I don't know how many, you know, it was like three years ago now, excuse me, 2019, February, 2019, actually to this day. Um, and so that was before the whole mass awakening with George Floyd, that was before that. And so understanding that this is a continuation of a conversation uh, that we're gonna need to continue to have. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, so much. I'll leave leave it over open to the uh, any panelists who would like to say any closing uh, closing comments. Uh, uh, Camilla, I will give that to you first because uh, your day should be ending. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you for the opportunity, and it was great to be in conversation with you all. Thank you. I'll say the same. Thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure to be here. 
Great. Thank you. Likewise. Okay. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to, you know, present my, some of my work and I uh, appreciate you all for your participation in, in the chat and just for being able to be a part of this conversation. So thank you all. Yes, yes, excellent. Um, panelists, feel free to, to hop off. I'm gonna stick around in case there's some questions that folks wanna chat a little bit, uh, um, kind of just to keep it uh, informal as much as possible. Oh yes, end of, end of uh, 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 session polling. Um, yes, final poll question. I'm sorry, I forgot about that in my notes. Final poll question, would you be interested in continuing conversation around reparations. Uh, if you can just chime into that to give us a little uh, a, a test into where, where we are with where we're gonna continue to keep the conversations going. Um, uh, I appreciate that. And again, as I said, I'll, I'll stick around here uh, for any folks uh, that would like to continue to chat. Camilla, if you get a chance, if you could uh, email